Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you, if you will, to turn with me to the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm. One of my favorite chapters, if not the favorite chapter in all the Bible. Closing out a sermon series today. It's been a little, was not in my attention. I intended to do them three in a row, but just felt like the Lord led me two other weeks to, to share a word. And so I'm going to close out our sermon today, our sermon series on sheep and shepherds. So let's look at the 23rd Psalm. Third Psalm. Is that better? It helps if you turn it on and not off. See, that's what I did. Not his fault, my fault. Sorry about that. Probably make, giving you a headache back there and a heart attack, but that's okay. The 23rd Psalm. Anybody love the 23rd Psalm? Don't you find it the most poetic chapter in all the Bible? Let, can we read it together? Can we do that? Congregation, who's up for that? Let me, let me see your hand if you're up for it. Now don't bail out on me halfway through it. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I would love to talk to you on a thought this morning, asking the Lord to anoint me. I would love to share on a thought. I know the shepherd. Anybody in this building, let me hear you if you know the shepherd. Oh, come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Come on and bless him if you know him. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you for your anointing that's here. There's a spirit that's just upon me today, God, that's just happy to be in the Lord's house. I don't know if it's just some studying I've been doing this week, God, or just looking, but I want you to hear from me. Where could, you know, being out of town and watching people live their lives, maybe it's just the fact that I'm happy to know you, to be in the house of God, that right now I could be doing bad things and bad places and putting myself in harm. But today, I know you, not because of something I've done, but because of what you've done for me. Thank you for that today. And I give you glory, and I give you honor. And all of God's children said, may God bless you and be seated. I know the shepherd. I, I cannot help but think, I mean, when I begin to study about this sermon series, does anybody else pick up on the fact that God just seemingly has a fascination with shepherds? I mean, if you really think about it, and just ponder on it for just a second. How much shepherd and sheep are in the Bible? Now, I'm going to stop right before we get good and going. And I, I'm going to help because this is a tricky sermon. I'm going to be helping my guys a lot. So on some of my tricky things, I might point at you. If I point out, you go. If, I, if not, you can follow me just a little bit. We're going to be okay. But let's, let, let's look at this. One, one cannot help but think about that. And unless you're blind, you've got to notice that God just loves shepherds and sheep. So I began to think about that when I began to study and begin to ponder some things while preparing the sermon. And some things come across uh, that I'd like to share with you. Think about this. It's on your hand up. The word flock is used more times in the Bible than the word church. The word shepherd is used more often than the word leader. Did you know the Bible uses the word sheep over 60 times more than it does the word Christian? It's interesting to me. I mean, from Genesis even on into Revelation, we see a really a common theme when it comes to this scripture. The way I like to view the Bible is it starts with Adam's sin, and it doesn't stop until Christ comes and sets up his kingdom and rights the wrong that Adam made. That's the way I interpret the whole Bible as a whole. But when you look at this, you've got to think of something. Along these great plot that is the gospel, there are some subplots that we stop at. 
And a lot of these subplots I begin to think about have to do with sheep and shepherds. Think about if they involve the lives of shepherds. Think about this. Abel, Rachel, Jacob, Joseph, 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, Moses, David, to Amos. Even God would invite out of nowhere. Have you ever thought about this? It's so, I, I didn't think about it until this week or Pat, two weeks ago. Think about this. Even at the nativity, when Jesus is born, seemingly out of nowhere, God sends an angel and says, give me some shepherds here. It just doesn't seem like a birthday party without some shepherds. We don't know their names. They really do nothing. But he says, Get, bring some shepherds into this thing. Think about that for just a moment. Not, not only that, God refers to himself as a shepherd in Genesis. Jesus in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd. The chief shepherd throughout the New Testament letters, and it does it in there. Matter of fact, I begin to think about this. The word pastor. Do you know that the word pastor comes from the Latin word meaning shepherd? I mean, it just seems like sheep and shepherds are ingrained into our culture as a church. And maybe that's what David understood when he wrote a whole song, a whole song about sheep and shepherds. Think about this. David connected the thought that living for God is like living for a sheep and a shepherd. And I, I want you to ponder this. David, who wrote this great song, he faced a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Think about this, first of all. He would be chased by predators, both lions and bears, but also giants, kings, when it comes to Saul and Achish. Not only that, Ziglag, his hometown, would burn the ground. He lived in the cave of Abdullah. His own son would rise up and try to destroy him. We come to all kinds of problems in this, all kinds of issues, but somewhere in the midst of all that, he writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, 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 he begins to write all these wonderful things. He says, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He wrote all of these things. What a powerful sermon, a powerful song because he meant it. And I began to think about that. And when I came across this true story, I said, man, it just, it, it was an awesome story. Can I share it with you? Anybody know Charleston Harris? Uh, Char God. Charleston Harris. What's his name? Yeah, I can say it right. It just won't come out right. Yeah. He don't like apes. I know that much. No plan of the apes, people, huh? Boy, that joke bomb bad. That's okay. Nobody know plan of the apes? Okay, you know, he didn't like apes? Okay, good. Moving on. That was wonderful. True story, Charleston. Heston. <laughs> See, it's there. He got up and he got up and he was invited to a presidential prayer breakfast. And he got up there and they asked him to read the 23rd Psalm. And he looked over, true story, and he saw Billy Graham. And he said, I'll read it on one condition that the Reverend Billy Graham will read it as well. So Charleston Heston got up and he began to deliver it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, Charleston, let my people go, guy. Very dramatic with only the flair that an actor can do. And when he delivered it and it was done, true story, the place erupted. And applause loud. It was awesome. And then they come Billy Graham, and Billy Graham got behind the podium with his little weary voice. And very subtle, he said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When he got through with the song, the story tells us in the article that there wasn't a dry eye in the place. When asked afterwards, Charleston Heston, what he thought about the different reactions. This was his true quote that I read. He said, they said, what do you think about the reactions? He said, you have to understand one thing. I know the psalm, but Billy knows the shepherd. I just want to tell somebody today that this song might, might mean a lot to you. I preach it in a lot of different places. Uh, every, about 90% of funerals, I love to read it. And everybody reads it together. We all know it by heart. They do it at basketball games. Everything is great, but it comes to the point right when they do that, but there's some of it that means a little bit more to us. For some of us, it's not just a song. For some of us, we don't know the psalm. We know the shepherd. We know the times that God made us lie down. The time we walked through the valley of the shadow of death. It might be a song for some, but to us, it's an anthem. And I want to speak to somebody that would just testify and say, Brother Donnie, 
I know the shepherd. I've been through the valley of the shadow of death. I've faced the lion and the bear. I've gone through the presence of my enemy. But God still made a table in the presence right there in front of everybody. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but aren't you glad to know that you don't know the psalm, but you know the shepherd. You know the pain of his suffering. You know of being led and being ministered to. You may know the psalm, but thanks be to God, we know the shepherd. Oh, think about that for just a second. Think about knowing the shepherd. When I begin to think about that, I begin to think, and not only does he know the psalm, he knew the shepherd. I begin to think about some bullet points. I, I, I think about this. He, he knew that, first of all, he, the, the enemy might make him lay down in still waters. He, he might make you, but it's only to find green pastures. God may lead you, and you might not like it, but it's to find still waters. He might allow your enemies to get around you and to come against you, but it's only to prepare an audience so that he might prepare your table. God might put you in the shadow of death, but that'll never change the fact that he will not leave you and he will not forsake you. I don't know what the wolves are saying today. I don't know what the lambs might be crying out behind you, the lions are the bears, but I will not focus on that junk. I'm focusing on the one shepherd who led me through the valley, who brought me where I needed to be, amazed and moved in my life. I'm glad today that I know the shepherd. Some of us today, we've sung some songs, but some of us know the meanings behind the songs. It's good to know that the shepherd may feed me at a table and the enemy of my heart, my soul might be around, but God's looking at him saying, I just wish somebody would try something. You sit right there and watch him eat. You sit right there and watch what I've done. You've come against them. You've fought them. You've tried it. Devil, I want you to sit right there and watch what I'm about to do in their life. He might make me walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but isn't it good to know that I could take my little sheep head and rub it right up against his chest? It's good to know that when I'm lost and I'm confused, I don't have to figure it out. I just got to listen to the voice of the shepherd. Don't listen to the valley. Don't listen to the bears. Don't listen to the lions, but know that you know the shepherd somebody. Give God glory and honor in this house. So think about that. We, we, we often, we, we go through difficulty and we say, I, I don't understand God. I, I want to know. I want to know the shepherd. Some of it, it might be just a song. But to some of us, it's a song that has to be sung. So before we go home today, let's look at three R's. Three R's in the first thoughts of the 23rd. Three R's. And the first thoughts of the 23rd. The first thought that he says is, The Lord is my shepherd. Okay, that lets me know that I know that the shepherd is responsible for his sheep. I just feel the Holy Spirit, I just need to stop and tell somebody right now, it's not your job, it's his. He's responsible. See, if I, let me take right here hidden in this nugget of a great chapter, I, I could share with somebody, and if I really, I've learned about the names of God, you know, the seven covenant names of God, and if I wanted to get an amen, all I'd have to do is start saying, I tell you what, church, he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, and somebody's going to say, yeah. Oh, I can get you going and say, oh, he's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals me. I, I can get it going. But hidden right here in the 23rd Psalm, 95% don't know that one of the covenant names of God is in here. It's Jehovah Raha, which means the Lord is my shepherd. That is a covenant name of God. Now think about that for just a second. The Lord is my shepherd. That is a covenant. That's a name. That's how we know God. We know God is a provider. We know God is a healer. But isn't it good to know that I know God is a shepherd? Somebody who will lead me. Somebody who will protect me. Somebody that will help me. He's responsible for his sheep. So think about this. Right here in the midst of all this. In a very unusual twist, the Lord, with a capital L, is my shepherd, capital S. Two names of God in one sentence. Isn't it interesting? When I begin to think about it, I begin to think about some things. I begin to think about uh, um, when we think of the word, Lord, the word Lord, we think of deity. When we think of shepherd, we think of humanity. When we think of Lord, we think of serving him. When we think of shepherd, we think of being served. When we think of Lord, we think of being led. When we think of shepherd, we think of being loved. 
When we think of Lord, we think of a golden scepter. When we think of shepherd, we think of a guiding stick. When we think of Lord, we think of majesty. But when we think of shepherd, we think of humility. Isn't it good to know that he is not just my Lord, somebody that I worship, somebody that I adore, somebody that I serve, somebody that I give my heart to and my life to, but he's also my shepherd, one who serves me, who loves me, who looks after me even though I wander, somebody who helps me even though there's a greater force against me. I'm glad that I know him as a Lord, but anybody in here glad that you know him as a shepherd, somebody who knows you as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, here's the thing. You can focus on the word Lord or you can focus on the word shepherd. But the, I guess I'm weird, but I focus on a different word. You focus on the word shepherd, I focus on the word my. To me, it's the most important word in the sentence. It's good to know that he's a Lord. He's good to know that he's a shepherd. But if I'm not included, what good does it do to me? Isn't it good to know that he's my shepherd? He's there for me. He helps my family. He gets me through my difficult times. He is my shelter. I, I, I thought of a true story I'll share with you. In a Sunday school class, the teacher asked all the Sunday school class, he said, I want you to memorize the 23rd Psalm. We're going to do it in front of the church next week. And Billy began to get nervous. Oh, goodness, I don't like that. How many people know what the greatest fear in the world is? Number one is public speaking. You know what number two is? Death. That means if you go to a funeral, people would rather be in the casket than the one delivering the eulogy. Okay? So here we go. He gets up, and everybody does a good job, and little Billy gets up there and he, in his little suit. It's his time, and he says, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. He began to forget. Lord is my shepherd. And then he stopped and said, the Lord is my shepherd. That's all I need to know. That's a funny story, but my goodness, out of the mouth of babes. Isn't it good to know I might not know what's rest of Psalm 23. I might need to know that there's goodness and mercy behind me. I might not know that there's a table being prepared for me, but all I need to know is God is my shepherd. He's my shepherd in the storm. He's in my shepherd in my difficulty. The devil comes at me and says, your God, and in the time of my difficulty, I might not have a God, but I certainly got a shepherd. Can I tell you that Jesus in the New Testament not one time referred to himself as king, but he stood up in front of everybody and said, I am the good shepherd that lays his life down for the ones that I love. I might have a king, but I'm telling you, I've got a shepherd. It's good to know he's my shepherd, my shepherd in the storm, my shepherd in my dark time, my shepherd in the valley, my shepherd in my sickness, my shepherd when the lion's behind me. Just because difficulty arises doesn't mean that I lose the one who's right next to me. You've got a shepherd, friend. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And the valley of the shadow of death doesn't turn him away, but it gets him right up next to you and said, let's get through this thing. I'm with you. Somebody give God glory and honor. <clears throat> why do I get excited? Brother Mark, why do I get excited about the Lord being my shepherd? I began to think about this this week. Think about this. In this sermon, in this past, excuse me, in this psalm, we get so confused that there's three people. The enemies, the shepherd, and the sheep. While I was praying, something came across my mind that there's some other characters. And the Lord just dropped into my spirit. He said, I got a shepherd, and I follow my shepherd. What does he say? The shepherd leads me. You can say right here, brother. Uh, brother Raglan's going to be my shepherd. He'd be a good shepherd. He's a great mayor. He's going to be a good shepherd. Just take it easy on me, though. Don't yank me too hard with that staff, okay? But he's a great, you're going to be my shepherd. You can sit right there and be a great shepherd. We get right here in the midst of this. But what does he say? He says, he leads me. So David's in here and goes, I got somebody in front of me. But then something, I just noticed, felt like somebody was watching me from behind. And I turned around, and there was goodness and mercy. I, I want to borrow a couple of people. Brother Greg, you got, and Brother Tom, these guys, are, they're, 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 
They do a lot of great work around here, and I, I, I hope they, they look out for us. But David said, I'm walking, and I'm listening to my shepherd, and I turned around, <clears throat> and goodness and mercy are following me. And I, and I go over here, and goodness and mercy are following me. And just something struck my spirit. You ever get something strike your spirit? And I just begin to ask God. And see, here's something. Our, our youth pastor so eloquently put it last week that the shepherd has a lot of items. And we went over him a bag, a club, a staff, and, and, and a sling. But we forgot one thing. And I just felt, I said, God, who's goodness and mercy? And then I realized, what good is a shepherd without a couple of sheepdogs? My dog. My dog. We're walking around. What good is it to be a shepherd if you don't have... So I began to study actual sheep. And what sheep dogs do is this. The shepherd in the distance, and that's why he says they know my voice, because you call. But the dogs drive the sheep. And I read that any time a sheep tries to wander off and get away from the herd, one of the dogs... I don't need to right now. I'm going over there. You get your chance to be my dog. Come over here and gets aggressive. Doesn't touch the sheep. And the sheep tries to get away. But the dog keeps getting in the way and drives them back to the herd and drives them on. Then the sheep might try to go this way and get on. I love what David said. He said, I got a shepherd. And he said, I got a shepherd that leads me. He's got a staff. He's got a sling. He fights for me. But isn't it good to know that goodness and mercy follows me? Let me talk to some sheep real quick in the building. Isn't it good to know that when I tried to wander off, when I got discouraged, when I got hurt, when I got defeated, and I tried to get away from the flock, I should have left by myself. I should have got away. It should have been my own doing that I went away. But when I looked up, there's mercy. And mercy said, nope, I don't think so. You better get back online. I tried to get around mercy. But mercy said no. If it was up to me, I'd have backslid. But mercy said, you better get back in line. Well, then I made up my mind. I might just go away to backslide. But I looked up, and there's goodness. My business should have failed. My baby should have died. My marriage should have ended. But goodness said, you better get back in line. I just want to tell somebody today, I don't know where you're at, and I don't know where you're going, but you can't get past mercy, and you can't get past goodness. God's goodness is following me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever because every time I try to get by, mercy says no. Goodness says you better think otherwise. Isn't it good to know that you've got a shepherd? Somebody give God glory and honor in this house. God bless you. Sheep dogs that drive the herd. Goodness and mercy will follow me. If it was up to me, I'd have wandered off. The second thing we need to know is not only is God res um, resp responsible for his sheep, He's responsive to his sheep. The second thought of the Psalm 23 is, I shall not want. The word want here comes from the Hebrew word meaning uh, kahir, kahir, uh, kahir, sorry, kahir, which means literally lacking for nothing. I don't lack. I begin to think about this, and anybody ever just started going over thoughts? Now, wait a minute. There were times that God told me no, or I didn't get what I was praying for. And I didn't get when I asked, and a thought occurred to me. Have we become so Americanized that we have confused the word need and want? Oh, I just feel like preaching for just a second in America. This bratty, bratty, bratty country that they're coming you when you order a hamburger, you better get it your way right away. If I order a pizza, I better get it in 30 minutes or less. And if it ain't just right, I want my money back. I, 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 we've become a generation, a country of wants. It's the way I want it. But we've confused wants with need. Think about it. If we're still here today, that means we've never had a need go un unmet. The fact that we're still here lets us know that God has met every single need. And the problem is, is we don't want to be sheep. I mean, honestly, if you look at professional sports teams, you've got everything from thunder to, you know, to a state You've got, uh, you know, birds, you've got tigers, I mean, you've got elephants, you've got things like a hokey that there's no such thing. But not even though we have make-believe mascots, not one time have you ever seen the San Francisco sheep. Because nobody wants to be a sheep. As a matter of fact, it's referred to negative. Oh, you're just being a sheep. Oh, I don't want to be a sheep. I don't even know what that means, but I don't want to be it. Think about it. Sheep, in the midst of all this, we don't want to be a sheep. We want to be, what would we want to be? A 
tiger, who's a tiger? I want to be a lion, a man where the mane, you know what I'm talking about, just flowing like 80s style with hair everywhere, you know what I'm talking about, Dukes of Hazard, just mane everywhere, just roaring all over the place. That's what, who would want to be a lion? Let's be honest, who want to be a lion? Y'all need the lion or y'all ready for me to wrap it up? Either way, you're in trouble. <laughs> I want to be a lion. We don't want to be a sheep. Sheep are needy. I came across this. I began to think about this in Psalm, the 34th chapter and the 10th verse that goes like, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that just a second. The, the young lions lack and suffer. When I'm a lion, I'm on my own. But the sheep that seek the Lord shall not like, like any good thing. Now let's go to that last scripture. I, I said, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. If you're here, if you are his sheep, it might not sound good. It might not be pretty. But when you say, God, I'm your sheep, he becomes responsible. I got some bullet points for you before we get ready. Look, think about these real quick. Why does it mean that I can be one of his sheep? Think about this. If you're hungry, he's the bread of life. If you're thirsty, he's the spring of living water. If you're lost, he's the way. If you've been living a lie, he's the truth. If you're in the dark, he's the light. If you're worried it will all come crashing down, he's your firm foundation. If you've been abandoned, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. If you find yourself broken, he's the mender of broken wings. If you're bruised, he's the balm of Gilead. If you're unstable, he's the He's the rock of ages. If you're lonely, he's Emmanuel, God with us. If you're stressed, he's the prince of peace. And if you're caught in the middle, it's okay because he's the first and the last. I don't worry to be called a sheep when he's got everything that I need. Somebody give God glory and honor in this house. The third and final R. The third thought is, he makes me lie down. See, I know the shepherd has rights to his sheep. Rights to his sheep. An interesting thought, when you start studying and thinking and meditating and pondering, an interesting thought will come to you. Think about this. I challenge anybody in this building to tell me another animal, animal that requires someone to look after them, like a shepherd. I began to think about it. First, my mind went to goats, but I looked it up. Goats don't require it. Cattle, when you drive cattle, you need someone to pick up the extra head, but mostly you don't need to look after them. Why? Because you mess with the bull, you get the horns, amen? If you think about all these animals, you could just go over constantly, all the pigs. No, you don't need, quote, unquote, someone watching them. The shepherd, like David, that stood out there day and night, or like Jacob, who was out there, and he said, I was out there in the cold with him. I was out there. And I began to think, why? And I began to study, not in biblical passages, just study sheep. And there's three reasons why. And you, they're, they're on your outline. Number one, they leave one another. The, the sheep just wander off. One wanders off, they look at it and go, ah, I didn't really like him anyway. And they leave. They do this. This is facts. They, they'll leave one another. Number two, they're timid. I, I just got through watching Gavin try to swim, and although he got the hang of it for the first part, he would stay on the step and he'd go. And sometimes that's the way sheep can be. You shepherd needs them to cross the, the calm waters, and they're just timid. They don't want to. They'll go back to what they know. And free, number three, they forget their routes. When I began to think about that, I began to think, man, no wonder the Bible refers to us as sheep. Number one, we have a habit of leaving one another, and that goes both ways. We got some people that just leave the flock, and then we got the flock that leave people. Oh, Y'all didn't amen that. I must be touching on a nerve. We got those that just make up their mind they're going to fall out of church, and then we got those that just look at somebody fall out of church and go, they really don't meet our criteria. They don't really meet our country club standards, so we'll let them just wander off. Y'all getting quiet means I'm touching the nerve, means I need to preach more. Somebody better know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about? We, we have sometimes that somebody might have markings all over their body and they don't meet our standard or they don't smell the way we want to or they're not wearing a tie or they have the audacity to wear something that we wouldn't wear and then they don't show up. We sometimes go, that's eh, all right. They'll find another church. Then we're timid. We're, we're timid. 
We, God wants us to do great things, but the 11 people stayed in the boat. All of them could have gotten walked on water, but isn't it good to know that when that happens, that one will call you out on the water? We're timid. The reason why God makes us go through difficulty is so that we will get out and get out and do what he's called us to do. We don't like getting poked with the staff, but if he didn't, we'd just sit around looking at each other until God came back. We'd be doing the same thing with the same look, singing the same songs, and the same sermons, sitting in the same chair, doing the same activities, doing all these things and just looking at each other saying, has Jesus come back yet? We go through that. But number three is really what I want the time to focus on. They forget their routes. They forget where they're going. I don't mean to sound horrible, and I might need to repent, but how dumb are sheep? You just get lost. You don't... And look, you've been in the same pasture your whole life, and you just get lost. I, I, I knew you wouldn't believe me. In this. So I, I found an article from 2010. Can I read that before we close? L -l -l Listen to this. This has happened, um, I believe it was in Afghanistan. Listen to this. More than 50 sheep on their way to slaughter in Turkey. Now, they didn't know that, okay? They are just heading on the trail beat their executioners to the bunch, and jumped to their deaths in an unexplained and unprovoked mass suicide. Herder Majid Ghana saw his animals and his money vanish into thin air when sheep suddenly leapt off a cliff. And, and then what happens is one jumped off a cliff, and then the other ones just followed him. A total of 52 sheep just jumped off the cliff, recovered at the bottom of the mountain range. And, and this is what was reported. Now, you might think that's bad. Look at this. Same article. Back in 2005, a newspaper reported 1,500 sheep jumped off a cliff in Turkey. Now, look at this. Only the first 450 were killed. Then they became a mattress for the other ones. <laughs> I, that's why I put it so y'all wouldn't think I'm making it up. This is actual copy and paste. 1,500. If my knees were good enough, I'd just walk right off stage, but they can't. You just walk right off. And then some of them look and said, where's he going? I think I shall find out. <laughs> and the one behind him said, that looked like fun. Hey, guys, you see what Bill just did? I think he found a shortcut. It's only a mile to the bottom. Let's go check it out. Sheep need a shepherd because they do dumb things like jump off a cliff. Now, I know that's funny, but I get to begin to think about today's church. Why you need to pray for a shepherd and your shepherd to keep you in the word, but we got a good shepherd in Jesus Christ, that today sheep are just going right off the cliff. They have embraced the things of this world, and today you can go to any church. You can go one in Birmingham, and they'll preach you the wrong doctrine, the doctrine of abomination, because the world's accepted it. I think it's time for it to change. And they just jump right off the cliff. And you know what happens? The next church looks and says, oh, the times are changing. If I, if I don't change my message, I'm not going to sell my best-selling book anymore, and I might not sell all my tapes, and then who's going to pay for my house in Tahoe? And I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So, hey, everybody, it's okay. Let's go see what Billy's doing down here off the cliff. And churches today, by the dozens, are just going right on off the cliff accepting things that are abominable, taking things that shouldn't be, refusing to preach the blood, refusing to talk about hell, refusing to preach conviction, and all the while there's not a shepherd. But isn't it good to know there's a good shepherd that when one's about to jump off the cliff and says, hey, buddy, you don't want to do that, you can get mad at me if you want to, and I hear you bad, and I feel you bite me, but I refuse to let you jump off this cliff. Why is there a shepherd? Because the sheep who are left to their own devices would kill them themselves. It's good to know I've got a shepherd, amen. Can I tell you, there have been times my doctrine was wrong. There have been times my attitude was wrong. There have been times that I wasn't living the way I should. That might upset you, but that's A-OK -okay with me. It's good to know that when I was flirting with the edge, there was a shepherd that's saying, uh-uh, you get back. Can we give God glory and honor? Stand with us real quickly, if you don't mind, and, let, let, and hear this last part. Hear me when I tell you, you're going to miss a great story if you're already tuning me out. But listen, the shepherd has rights to the sheep. Man, I just feel the Holy Ghost. I want to say that again. The shepherd has rights to the sheep. 
You won't hear it preached in today's church because we become a church that's filled with rights. We worship the way we want to. We read the Bible when we want to. We come to church when we want to. And we've forgotten that you're not here so that Jesus can just serve you. You're here to serve Jesus. He's got rights to you. Paul said you've been bought with a price. You no longer belong to you, but you belong to him. The shepherd has rights to the sheep. In this book I read, Philip Keller talks about the day he bought 30 sheep. He bought 30 sheep, and his neighbor, who was also a shepherd, they were sitting there, and they were looking at the herd, and his neighbor gave Philip the knife and said, now you get to mark them. And to mark them meant they would take each ear of, an ear of each sheep and lay it on a wooden block, take out a knife, and carve his mark into the ear of sheep. He said, by the time the 30th sheep was done, I don't know who it hurt worse, me or them. The blood flowing and the bang and the crying out. He said, it's a process I will never forget. But he had to mark the sheep. See, somebody here today and you know the shepherd and you're about ready to get bitter at the shepherd because you look up and you're bleeding. You look up and you're being hurt. Oh, this pretty church age didn't promise you. They didn't, they didn't say to you that, hey, everything was going to be A-OK. -okay. They tell you, they say, hey, don't you worry. It ain't going to hurt. There ain't going to be no pain. You accept Jesus Christ, and buddy, you're going to be, everything's going to be wonderful. If you read my new book, everything's going to take care of you. If you buy my miracle water, you just live your best life now, you ain't going to have any problems. Anybody feeling what I'm laying down? Anybody picking up what I'm laying down? You know what I'm talking about? They promised this. But somebody in this building knows what it's like to have blood start running down the side of your head. To look up and be hurt and pain and said, I've trusted you and now I find myself hurt and in pain. But what we have to understand is that the shepherd is marking us. Look at what Corinthians tells us. Now it is God who makes us both, you and I, stand firm in Christ. He anointed us and set his seal of ownership on us marked us, hurt us, branded us, if you will. Somebody don't understand it. You don't understand the pain. You don't understand the hurt. It was supposed to be easy. It's not easy. Somebody know what I'm talking about in this building? It wasn't easy. It hurt. You bled. It was difficult. You went through some rocky patches. You went through some difficulty, and now you got blood running down the side of your head. See, the problem with us is we all own dogs or cats. What do you put on your dog or cat? A collar with a nice little shiny bone or paw print or fish. Some of y'all go real crazy with your dogs. I've seen it. It's, they're your other babies. Two people who weren't with us today, they're really, really bad. It's like they're great, great grandchildren. But we like collars. Can you imagine taking your dog? And you take, imagine taking Molly and just cutting in her ear. See, here's the problem before we close. Christians today have become collar Christians. We want it easy. We, we don't mind the bling on our neck. We don't mind the looking nice. Here's the problem with collars. You can take them off and somebody else put another one on them. But when somebody comes to steal the sheep, and somebody comes that doesn't have good intentions and they're getting ready to claim something that's not theirs, they can't remove the collar because the collar's been marked in them. And I want you to know that's what this scripture's telling us. It says you've been placed with a seal of ownership that when defeat, depression, the enemy, heartache, all kinds of problems come to claim you, they can't remove your collar because your collar has been marked in you. Before we close and go home today, there's some people here today that are bleeding. You've been marked, friend. It doesn't feel good, but it's a seal of ownership. And what hurts today protects me tomorrow. Let's me know that I've been through the fire. I've been tested. I've been good. I've been whole. You can't claim me because somebody else has already claimed me. And it's what you went through, the blood that went down the side of your head that's caused the enemy to have to back off and not claim what is not his. Every head bowed and every eye closed. 
I just feel like I got to, it might be one or two, I don't know. I just feel in my spirit, I got to give this an opportunity. And I do know that there's going to be some people that's going it, to, it, it's hard. And I'm not going to keep us, it's time to go, I'm aware. But right now, if you're in this building today, you've been going through some difficulty. It's been marking you. It's been hurting you. You've been bleeding. Well, you just need to be reminded that you know the shepherd. That's all you need to know is the Lord is my shepherd. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just really feel like there's one or two in this building that are really hurting today.